Did all that paper get used? I don't know how many pages it was. Okay. Uh, does anybody have an open seat? Uh, this one is like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else need paper for name tag? Sorry, you want to sit with uh, Derek? Okay. Yeah. Oh, you can sit. Oh, you guys can be friends. Oh, it's okay. It's okay for now. <laughs> okay, hi everyone. I'm Dr. Kriwani. Uh, I'll be your instructor for Astro 1000. If you are not in Astro 1000, you're in the wrong room. That's the class, right? No one's leaving yet. That's good. Um, we're going to just briefly talk about uh, sort of what's in the class. Um, I would love to do introductions, but that would take longer than the class period. So we're going to try and get to know one another. Um, on Canvas, I have a, wel a welcoming questionnaire. So go in there. Uh, let me know what your name is, uh, preferred pronouns, what you're trying to get out of the class, like what you're interested in. About 30 of you have already answered. That's great. So I already can um, disappoint a few of you. This is um, Introduction to Planetary Astronomy, um, specifically planetary. So for folks who want to know about black holes and galaxies, you won't. Okay? So if that makes you want to leave, that's fine. Um, but I promise the rest of it's going to be really fun. We're going to learn about these things. Um, you guys know what these are? Fine, All right. Uh, what's this thing? Yeah, let's go. To scale? Ooh, tricky, tricky, right? Um, this is yeah. So that's the size of the sun off on the side. Um, that's Jupiter to scale. Where's us? I mean, it helps that it's written up there, right? Third rock. From the sun, you guys know that film? It's like 60 minutes before your time. All right, that's Earth, tiny, tiny. Um, so we'll talk about the planetary system that we exist in. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, how it formed. Um, we'll talk a tiny bit about our sun as it fits into planetary formation. And then if we have time, we'll talk about um, other planetary systems. And of course, one of the questions that I think almost everyone has are we alone in the universe? Okay, so who am I and why am I qualified to stand up here in the gap? Um, I got my undergraduate BS in astrophysics at UC Santa Cruz. 
I then got my PhD in physics and, uh, sorry, astrophysics and planetary systems in uh, CU Boulder. I went to DC to work at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center for two years. Um, what I do outside of teaching is I study the atmosphere of Mars, um, current atmosphere of Mars. So one, you might not know that Mars has an atmosphere. It does. In fact, it has clouds. So what I'm interested in doing is understanding how the clouds form and what it can tell us about the atmospheric dynamics on the planet and how that might tell us about Earth and also about ancient Mars. Um, has anyone here seen a shooting star? Okay. Do we know that they're actually not stars? Okay, good. All right, what are they? Comets? Not quite. Not quite. Meteors, good, okay, it's good. We're gonna learn all these words. If you already knew everything, why come to class, right? <laughs> okay, so what are meteors? Space and rocks doing what? Burning. Catching on fire. So in fact, that's the other part of my research. I look at tiny rocks hitting the top of the atmosphere of Mars, catching on fire, and then they leave the material in the top of the atmosphere. Um, there are some seats too, if you guys want, like, sort of in the back there, there's two. That way you can ask the next one. And then there's like one over here too. Okay. And if you need a name tag, I will try my best to learn your name. I, I'm really bad at this. I can tell you how to get from point A to point B, like which streets to turn left and right on, but I can't tell you one of the streets. Does that make sense? That's just not how my brain works. Okay, so um, I have been at CSUSB for four years. This is the start of my fifth year. So I started during the pandemic. That was great. I'm sure all of you loved the pandemic. It was really easy to learn, right? Um, I taught my first class, um, which is a similar size to this, and every single screen was off. Really great to get feedback. So I love to be able to stand in front of you and like see you be like, oh, I get it, versus, oh, what the fuck? Um, <laughs> So in that respect, you know, we, we want to make sure that this is a really big group. So if you have questions, do raise your hand and don't just blurt out. We want to be conscientious of everyone else's time. Um, and also, you know, if you're if you know all the answers, you know, give someone else a try, right? Like I get that you're this one, right? Okay. Cool. Um, I am a science team. Oh, I should update that. Damn it. Okay, so these two missions are at Mars right now. This is the NASA Maven spacecraft that you see here. I'm also on the TGO mission, that's with the European Space Agency. And next year, um, the Japanese are gonna fly a mission to Mars that I'm affiliated with. I really wish I could see that one. They launch off of this Japanese island. That'd be really cool. And then you like sit on a boat and watch it, but it's like very limited. So. Okay, questions about this? Um, I ask everyone for more questions at the end of the questionnaire. So um, do look on Canvas. There's some things like the syllabus, the welcoming questions and um, the content calendar about like what we're going to do when. Uh, and we'll go over more of that on Thursday when you've had the time to actually read it. Does that seem reasonable? I'm just going to try and get you stoked about the class in general. Cool. Cool. Questions? Mm -hmm. okay. All right, if there was a switch that you could flip to improve your grade by half a letter, would you do it? Raise your hand for yes. Uh, does everyone know what that switch is? What? No, there's a switch, a physical switch. Maybe we don't think of them as switches anymore. Is it extra credit? I mean, it's not. It's not extra credit. Okay, let's not do that. Okay, it's turning your phone off. <laughs> These are great outcomes for folks who are, and for example, some people take notes on their, their computer. I have a problem with that, right? But if you're texting the whole time, you're obviously not going to be paying attention. By the time that you look up, you've lost the plot, maybe you lose the entire lecture. I'm gonna try my best to keep y'all engaged by doing activities, breaking it up so that we're thinking, not just listening the whole time. But one of the easiest things you can do is turn your phone. I know that's crazy, right? An hour and 15 minutes. You're gonna be looking at space. Okay. Um, we'll talk about exams. Um, you have the textbook where you have an ability to find the textbook. 
it looks like this if you have the seventh edition, eighth edition, ninth edition, that's all good. I don't care. Third edition, probably fine. We're currently on the 10th edition. Um, if you find it online for free, you're not supposed to be able to do that. Okay? That make sense? Okay. This is being recorded. Um, all the lectures I will post on YouTube afterwards, and we'll talk about what the expectations would be. Sometimes you hear that, you're like, oh, I'm out, right? No one stood up, which is great. Um, but if you decide, hey, I can't make it to class, um, that's perfectly fine. Just let me know ahead of time, um, and we'll talk about some of the expectations for that. For homework, do not buy, do not buy Mastering Astronomy. Don't do it. Students don't learn with it. We're going to try something new. If it fails, it's on me. It's not on you. Okay? But I'm going to try to save you money because everything costs a shit ton. And we'll talk about grades on Thursday because you're going to read the syllabus, right? Your first reading study. Okay. What's this, by the way? Sorry. Why does it look weird? Interesting. Okay, I heard negative color, I heard infrared, ultraviolet maybe. So what I'm hearing is that this is not the light that we see with our eyes. That would be the easiest way to explain it. And in fact, it is ultraviolet. This is a form of light that we're seeing. This stuff here, right? These explosions, those are real. The sun's surface is a dynamic place. So it's, it's erupting. Like essentially you can think of volcanoes on the sun, except it's uh, plasma. And we'll talk about what all those words mean later. Okay. Um, this is a general education class for astronomy. This is not a physics class. This is not an algebra class. So I am sort of adapting how I want you to come away with your own goals. I've already listened to a few few folks um, from the the, um, the welcoming questionnaire. And in particular, you know, some of the things that you want to do is you want to learn cool new concepts. You want an A or a B. That's pretty consistent across the boards. I can identify with that. So I would like to serve your educational goals. That is to say, I want you to feel like you walked away putting in as much as you could and getting out what you got out of it, right? To that end, I want you to think about how to use critical thinking skills, how to reason based on the evidence that's presented, how to build mental models to interpret new information and adapt them, okay? We're gonna do that by looking at these three things, learning why the solar system looks the way it does, understanding how we know what we do about the solar system, and then to appreciate the fact that we know any of it at all. Okay, so let's start up here on the left, what's that? Okay. All right, raise your hand for moon. Raise your hand for Mercury. Raise your hand for I don't like raising my hand, and I hope you don't do this the whole time. <laughs> okay, good. In fact, we will have clickers. So I'm going to distribute clickers at the end, and you'll sign a little thing, and we'll implement them on Thursday. So since there's a lot of you, and I didn't think about how long it would take to pass them all out, we'll do them at the end of class, and we'll just do hands and engagement in the first day. Okay? Okay. So this one was? Mercury. Mercury. Good. All right, there's a little hint, right? Kind of in order here. So let's do all of them just so we have them. So Mercury, Venus, Earth. Okay, what's that one? The moon, our moon specifically. This one? Mars. Mars. Best one, right? Or second best? All right. This one? Jupiter. Jupiter. Saturn. Saturn. If you like it, you should put a right. <laughs> do all of them have rings? No. Raise your hand for yes. <laughs> Where's your hand for no? All right, we got some people who know. All of them have rings. They're just not as pretty. It's the best one, right? Like he went to Jared. Okay. <laughs> this one? Uranus. Uranus. Not what you want to say. Right? <laughs> and this one? That's good. That was good. good. All right. There's Pluto. Hey. Hey. We'll get to that. Okay, so in this class, uh, just a course overview, we're going to talk about what we're going to talk about, and then I'll talk about what we're not going to talk about. So we're going to study very, very large scales and sizes, okay? 
Um, understanding how big stuff is and how far away it is is going to hurt here, right? What we're used to, the types of numbers, they don't really make sense. So I'm going to try and contextualize them with uh, some comparisons, ways of like acting it out so that you can feel that like you understand a little bit better. And the more that you think about it when you go home, the more uncomfortable you'll be. Okay. Here's us. That's the Earth. It exists in the solar system. That exists in the Milky Way. It exists in the local group inside the local supercluster. You can tell um, astronomers are really good at naming things. <laughs> really, really creative. Uh, and we all in the same universe. Oh. Okay. Um, we're going to talk a little bit, just very briefly, about um, how our position here on Earth affects what we see. So we're going to talk very briefly about celestial motions, that is how the night sky moves. And in particular, if you know, if you ever, I mean, I don't know how many people, there are a few freshmen here, right? Can I say if you're a freshman? Okay, just a couple. So most people have seen that there's an observatory on the hill. Has anyone been there? Okay, good. All right, wonderful. So we will have open houses. We just posted um, all the open houses for the semester. We'll have one tomorrow. And it's a great opportunity if you're, if you're interested in seeing the night sky through a telescope, you can come and look at things like Saturn with your own eyes. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about celestial motions there. We'll talk about eclipses, how they form, and what causes the moon to have phases. Um, we'll talk about what shaped the terrestrial planets. What's this one? Mars. Very good. What's this one? Mars. What's this one? Mars. Okay, good. All right. It's a little, <laughs> a little tricky here. So what's happening in this top one? Something's landing. Something's landing. Yeah. So in fact, if we go back, I'll show you at the very beginning. It seems like something moved away from the camera very quickly. That's the heat shield. So this is a rover that comes in, flies in with the heat shield, and then blows a parachute, and the heat shield falls below it. And so then it lands and stands on the surface and takes photos like this. So Mars looks pretty cool, right? Like it looks similar to us. You can tell that there are these rock things. We have rocks. It's got like dust and stuff. We have dust and stuff. So kind of that's, yeah, see that? That was the heat shield falling away. You wanna say it again? Come on. Come on now. Yep, right there. That's the heat shield. All right. Okay. You may start to see other features. We'll talk about some features that we see at most of the terrestrial planets, that is, planets that have rocky surfaces. And that'll tell us about what drives those features. Okay. Oh, uh, gosh. All right, we'll talk about why there is abundant life on Earth. Basically, everywhere you look on Earth, something creepy crawling, right? Um, but apparently none on Mars or Venus. We'll talk about some of the challenges to say life arising on those planets, okay? We're gonna talk about why Earth is so different from Jupiter. This one's good. <laughs> That's a scale. Are you going for yes? Are you going for no? Okay. This is the scale. Jupiter big. Jupiter really big. Does anyone know what the great red spot is? The storm, very good. Is it in this picture? Yes. Yes, it's right here. And it's in fact a storm that we've seen as long as we've had telescopes, so more than 300 years. So imagine, if you will, like, you know, there's hurricanes that hit Florida constantly. Imagine a, a hurricane that's just hitting Florida for 400 years. That would be crazy, right? But thankfully, there's no surface on Jupiter, as we'll find out. So there's no people at the bottom that are getting barreled by this storm constantly. Okay? And to scale, this is the Earth. So you can think about the Great Red Spot. It's basically an Earth-sized object, right? We'll talk about a little bit why that happens what makes it so that there are these beautiful colors, like what those colors are, and why there's so much texture. One of the best parts of this class is that even if you learn nothing, you're going to see a ton of really cool photos because, and not to shit on other parts of astronomy, but we can go to the places that we're talking about and we can take photos and cameras keep getting better, right? 
So for example, this is, come on, oops, let's go back one. Do you see this by the way? What's that? That's a moon. Isn't that cool? So the sun is off to the right. Obviously they're hidden. Um, but there is a moon in this image that's blocking that part of the illuminated disk of Jupiter. This is a recent image from something called the JWST or James Webb Space Telescope. Well, we don't really like to use anything other than the acronym because the guy was a dick. Um, <laughs> so this is infrared light, as we were talking about earlier. These are forms of light, for example, that snakes can see. So that's what I always like to use in the back of my head. So ultraviolet light is like what bees and butterflies see. And then infrared is like what snakes can see. They like sense you. If you've ever played like Call of Duty, that's the heat seeking version, right? So you're seeing really here, you're seeing heat. You're seeing cooler and hotter parts of the planet. And uh, you can see lots of features here. This is. Okay, um, go full screen. So you can see a lot of features here. In fact, you can see these really dim features. You see this thing here that looks like a six pointed star? So anytime you see a JWST image, unlike the crosshairs that you're traditionally used to seeing that come from normal telescopes, JWST has like a Mercedes Benz logo. So it produces this like six figure star. And you'll see that diffraction pattern on anything that's a point or a circle. Here you can see the great red spot, but now it doesn't look red, it looks white. That's because it's really hot. White means hot in these types of images. And you'll also see some really cool stuff at the bottom and the top here. These are aurora, or the northern lights of Jupiter, happening at the very top and at the very bottom. We'll talk a little bit about why that happens. What's this, by the way? That's another moon. That's one of the moons. Yeah, so this is one of the many moons of Jupiter. Jupiter's got a ton. And like 60 plus 70. Here's a closer in image. That's beautiful, right? That's a real picture of a real planet. Um, and we'll talk about the fact that it has all these little stripes and why they form. And then these different colors start telling you about the composition. What's what what is it made of? Questions, comments, concerns? Cool. Okay, so some folks will be like, what the hell? To do a clue, I should have done the top part again. Let's do this one more time. Okay, um, I'm going to show you. So I told you that we can go to places. Do you know that we went to Pluto? Not like me personally, um, but we as a human humankind went to Pluto. We sent a spacecraft called New Horizons, and it flew by. So I'm about to show you actual every actual image that we took in like a. 30 second montage. <laughs> okay, so that'll be up in the top right hand corner. So you're going to see something that looks brown and smudgy, and then it'll get close. And as it gets closer, you'll see features on the surface, and then we'll pass behind it, and we'll see it from behind. And just like you're seeing here, it'll have this like, see this little ring at the very top? That's like the atmosphere of Jupiter, very top of the atmosphere of Jupiter. We'll see the atmosphere of Pluto. Okay, ready? So this is us getting closer, getting closer. This is Sputnik Planitia, um, this giant heart-shaped object on the surface of Pluto. And we just passed Charon as it went on the other side. And that's the atmosphere of Pluto. Isn't that great? Okay. Okay. Uh, ooh, that's really good. I'll figure this out. I'm normally teaching this. Is that okay? All right. Um, there are some Plutos, this one object here. Maybe you grew up thinking that it was a planet. It's not that it's not a planet, it's just a dwarf planet. Um, and we'll talk about why that's okay to say in the context of um, planets. Um, it's one of many objects. Here you see Pluto and its moon Charon, um, but it's also not the largest KBO, which is a Kuiper Belt object, the place that it lives. It's not its even largest neighbor. So if you want to make this a planet, then you have to name like 50 other planets and no one's going to remember the anomaly for that one. Okay. 
We'll talk a little bit about in which ways solar systems that we see in the rest of the universe are similar to ours and in which ways they're different. Okay. We'll talk about how we find them and what the implications, of course, there are for life. Um, what isn't this course? Memorizing constellations. You won't do that. I don't even know them, and I work at the observatory. Um, so I like, you know, I practice before I go out there and I try to see them, and then, you know, some six year old's like, what shit is that? And they're right. So that happens, you know, you just got to know how to have grace when you say that you're wrong. Um, what will you learn? So there's another class that's uh, intro to galaxies and cosmology, and that's Astro 1010. And so you'll learn stuff like what makes the sun hot. So that's nuclear fusion, giving it away. Do stars exist forever? No, they explode like this. Um, does that have to be like relatively close? Okay, is interstellar accurate? The first like three quarters, I guess. <laughs> Not the last bit. It's fine. It's still a bit of film. Um, what 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 kind of galaxies exist? A lot. This is JWST images, just of a tiny, tiny fraction of the sky. So this is a star. This is a star. This is a star. Anything with a six-pointed part is a star. Everything else is a galaxy. Yeah. And in every galaxy, there's something like 200 billion stars. On average, there's about one planet per star. So depending on what you're interested in, if you just want to think about mind-boggling numbers, that's a lot of stars. Yeah, so in the middle here, you have a very massive galaxy and it's bending light around it. So you have essentially this stretched out. So this is the same image as that. It, you'll learn about that in time. Yeah. Are we able to know like how old other galaxies are? Or like... I'm not going to tell you. Okay, uh, some folks want to know, like, uh, what's the Big Bang about? How can you possibly know that? Because we have a picture of it. This is the picture of it. Um, this is the edge of the observable universe. This is looking back in time. And the simplest concept I like to use here is if you look at a photo, say, like on your um, mantelpiece of your cousin or your aunt or your grandma, it's always a picture of them older, right? Can't be a picture in the future. You have a really cool camera, right? So generally speaking, life takes some amount of time to get to us. Technically, I'm seeing you younger than I'm seeing you in the very time, because life takes longer to get to you. So just keep using that extrapolation, right? So if you go and you look at the very, very edge, very first light that was ever um, emitted, it's still traveling to us. Uh, there's some clarifications on how that is possibly understandable, but that's an interesting place. Okay, question? Okay. Cool. Well, let's understand some of the sizes and scales here really quickly. Um, I mentioned uh, that this is the, the opening picture. So what's wrong with the picture here? We have all of our favorite friends, right? This was the, the sun, yeah. Plants are all in line, okay. So is that bad? It's impossible? It's very rare, yeah. In fact, it is very rare. So interestingly enough, and I didn't, you're not a plant, uh, this is a real question from the audience. Tomorrow morning, if you wake up before dawn, you will get to see what's called the planetary parade, where four or five of the major planets will be visible to your naked eye. So you'll look from left to right, you'll see Mercury, Venus, we are on Earth, so that counts. You'll see Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn across the sky. Now, not in the order that they have here, and of course, you won't see Uranus and Neptune, right? So as we view them, they're kind of out of order. These ones are always in the same order, Mercury and Venus, more or less, you see them? So you're right, the ordering is very suspect. Anything else? Yeah. Too close. They're too close, right? If Jupiter was here, we'd all be in a lot of danger, <laughs> right? Okay, and if we're that close to the sun, we'd all be dead. Okay. All right. Um, that word is weird, series. 
don't quite know why that's there, right? So in fact, there's a little asteroid belt that sits in between Mars and Jupiter. And the largest object there is quite large, actually. It's spherical, and it has ice on its surface. So of course, if you want to make Pluto a planet, you kind of have to ask the question, is Ceres a planet, sir? And I get it's a little smaller, but we didn't want to play that game. We just called that game for a planet. Okay. So it's all about satellites. Or is there other classifications? So we'll get into that a little bit because, of course, moons can be quite large. So Ganymede, which is the moon of Jupiter, is larger in some cases than Pluto, or in some cases from other things that we might consider planets. But it doesn't get to be that as it orbits Jupiter. Right? We have to like create definitions. But definitions are just constant, right? Okay. Um, there's spots here on this side too. Yeah, no worries. Okay. So, <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Okay. So, hold on. Let's do now. We're going to um, turn all the lights on. All right. Center on. And then, uh, there we go. Okay. We're going to have an activity. So, I need volunteers. All right. Let's build the solar system. This is not my lunch. Oh, good. We have lots of volunteers. Yeah. We're going to build a one. God, what did I put here? Ten. How many zeros is that? The three, three zeros is. Three zeros is a. A thousand. Good. Six zeros is a million. That's how much we all want to make, right? So you say six figures. That's not the same as six zeros. Right? Okay, nine zeros, a billion. How many zeros I got there? Ten is just ten billion, right? So let's shrink the sun down ten billion times. Which object? Watermelon. The watermelon. Everyone, raise your hand for watermelon. Okay. Anyone not watermelon? Okay, why not watermelon? Yeah, of the size, yeah. Does that be too easy? I had to throw in one fruit to throw you off. It's the grapefruit. <laughs> okay. Um, who wants to be the sun? All right. Can be the sun? Um, do you mind standing in the front of the class? Okay, who wants to be Mercury? You're your hands up. Okay, so y'all get to you. We have lots of plants. Okay, all right, so you're the sun. Okay, so now what size do we make Mercury? What's that? Less than a grain of sand. Less than a grain of sand. That's bold. Anyone agree with that? One, two, three, four. Yeah, that's correct. Grain of sand. So not visible on the table. So I didn't, I didn't grab dirt off the ground, but I should have. Um, hold on. Can I find any? Here you go. <laughs> All right. Good. So now stand here. No, you're the sun. You don't fall. Okay. So now here's the game. Okay, we're gonna separate them. How far away do we have to put them? The medium scale. Medium scale, yeah. So this is the right scale now, right? So we got Mercury, right, Mercury and the Sun. They're all shrunk down properly. Is this right? No. Okay, all right. Some people think outside. Raise your hand for bigger than this. Raise your hand for smaller than this. No one likes smaller. They've been tricked too many times already. Okay, let's hold them right there. All right, let's do the next one. We had Mercury. We said, oh, shit. You saw nothing. You saw nothing. All right, what's Venus? <laughs> All right, you ready? You ready, Venus? Okay. So you're just gonna take your finger, we're just gonna dot it. That's gonna be Venus. What's Earth? 
Okay. What is YouTube? Raising it? Yeah. All three of you? Okay. This is. Oops. That's Venus. Uh, one of you is going to be the Earth. <laughs> so what about Mars? Bigger and smaller than this. Smaller. Smaller. So bigger than a ballpark then? Okay. So we need what? Smaller than a ballpoint pen, what did I just use? Piece of like a granule of chalk, right? That's why I broke all these tiny granules. Okay, who wants to be Mark? <laughs> okay, come on up. All right, now we get into the fun one, the one that you can see. All right, how big is Jupiter on this scale? Okay, I hear blueberry. Bigger or smaller than blueberry for Jupiter? Right. Is your hand for bigger? Your grapes? Say, so your grapes, and nobody likes like the nectarine, white nectarine? 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 What about lime, orange? Are these just like, like lime? <laughs> Anyone for lime? Not just like generally, but like for the example? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> It's great. Anyone want to be great? No, we're great. All right. Come on up. <laughs> Are we in order again? Yeah. All right. Um, let's see. What else did I include here? Um, what about Pluto? I know we skipped a lot of planets. One of the granular shots. Okay. Anyone want to be for them? Their, their job will be. Okay. So this is like roughly the right word. <laughs> this is roughly the right ordering, but it's not the right thing, right? Right? Yeah. 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 No one falls asleep, right? Okay. So um, how far away do they need to stand? So you're the sun. Why don't we bring you over here now? Okay. And just tell him to come in until everyone says stop. Is that right? Yeah. Farther back? No. No. All right, bring him all the way in. Bring him all the way in. This is too close, right? If he was here? Yes. That's too close. But that's too far by a lot. Keep going. All right. What about what about that? Is that too close? That's right. I mean, we've never been in Mercury. How would we know, right? <laughs> in terms of the actual distance to, if the sun is that big and Mercury is the piece of dust in his hand, that would be the relative distance. So bigger or smaller? It's okay if you have no intuition for this and you'd be like, what the fuck is going on? That's perfectly fine. Okay? You're next. Okay, now you may not have memorized how far all the distances are, right? So where does Venus go? Okay, it's pointed to about here. Let's bring Venus in. Closer, farther. There. People like this, raise your hand if you like this distance. Raise your hand if you hate this distance. Okay, all right, all right, that's fine, that's fine. All right, uh, this is Earth, this is us. Woo! Okay, where do we go? Well, not us. I'm always on this one, so let's get ready to go. Okay, all right, slow down, slow down. Do you like this one? No, no, back up. Ready? Let's go, let's go. There we go. There we go. It's fun, it's like your pressure, right? <laughs> okay, but it's learning. Okay. Success? We're good with this? Yeah. All right, now we got Mars. Is that good? Raise your hand if you like that. Okay. Raise your hand if you hate it. Raise your hand if you're completely lost. Okay, good. I like that. Honesty. Um, that's Jupiter back there with the grape. Is that good for Jupiter? 
Do we have some people pushing? No one's pulling? No one thinks closer? No? Okay. We like that? Further? You like that? Okay. And then Pluto's here, still in the classroom. Uh, is that right? No, but well, we're not going to make him leave. Come on. All right. That's just what we're going to see how this goes. All right. So, do you think we got it? No. Raise your hand if you think we got it. Raise your hand if you think it's a trick. Yeah, it's a trick. All right. All right. We got it. Okay. So don't don't sit down, y'all. So Mercury should be 19 feet away. So yeah, go ahead and come to probably about where she is. You know, maybe here. Right, right about here. <laughs> about 19 feet. Okay. So now Venus is about 36 feet. So that's probably closer out to about here. Okay. And on that scale, the Earth is about 50 feet away. So why don't you go to about where he is? Yeah, yeah. All right. So now we're already seeing that the inner solar system basically doesn't fit in this room. Because Mars is 75 feet away. So he's basically, I mean, at the door, essentially. Right? Well, don't go. No. <laughs> you don't have to leave. You don't have to leave. Okay. And of course, Jupiter at this scale is not in the inner solar system. It's in the outer solar system. So it's about 250 feet away. Yeah, so it's far too long. So usually what I like to do when I do this demonstration is as you walk out today, you know, about halfway into um, N, that's like where you are, 250, okay? And where's Pluto? Somewhere, right? Somewhere. In the parking lot. You can have that grape. <laughs> you can have the dust too if you guys want it. But <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Um, where's Pluto? What's that? Parking lot. Parking lot. That's a good guess. It's a good guess. Lake Arrowhead. All right. Now we're getting a little crazy. Okay. So in fact, uh, it's uh, about a third of a mile away, which is about where the observatory. So as you leave today and you look up at the observatory, that's where Pluto is. And remember, this is how big the sun is. In that okay, you guys can sit down. Thank you. <laughs> Round of applause. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what the is, but I've heard that, like, even, like, if you just go to the actual side of the planet, they were all fit into and the system of Earth. Right. Yeah, that's another big one. The moon and the earth, you often think of them as right next to each other. They're not. So we can do that demo too if you want. But I didn't bring my objects and I didn't make it. But I will. Okay. All right. So this is the one that likes to, you know, um, like to fuck with people's brains and get you to think about how empty space is. So we shrunk all of our solar system, right? All of the planets fit basically between us here and where the observatory is in about a third of a mile. That's all the planets, right? And so everyone you know and has ever loved is on where is it? Like something this big, those speck. All right, whatever. Imagine there's a speck of dust in my hand going around a great right? Okay. So now you get in a spaceship and you start flying and you want to go find aliens. Okay. To find the nearest star, not this one, the next to nearest, where do you have to go? Well, this, scale, this, scale? this scale, yeah. On this scale, you're flying off the dust boat. McDonald's. McDonald's, okay. What are you defining as an alien? No, no, no. Oh. Near star. Oh, Near star. star. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to open up any bag of worms. <laughs> so, What's that? LA. Probably to LA. Okay, that's pretty far on that scale. France. Okay. <laughs> All right, we got some bounds here. Okay. Stream bound on one end, small bound, maybe. Do people like LA? No. No, they're just used to tricks now, right? Yeah, anything else? I want to say to the like, nearest, the uh, next state border, like Texas or Oregon. Like okay. Okay, so maybe Oregon. That's a pretty good one. I was Hawaii. Hawaii? Hawaii is a perfectly good one. Okay. Yeah, it's about New York City. I feel like I'm the country. Yeah. 
So this is where we are, approximately. That little dot is us. That little dot is New York City. And they're colored properly. This is the color of our sun. This is the color of the nearest star. And it's about this. This is us. And somebody this is wet. <laughs> and there's actually two stars there. They're like this. But they're in New York City. And there's nothing in between. That makes sense? How long yeah. do you travel? Uh, it takes light 4.3 years moving at the fastest possible speed. So if, even if we moved at, say, a thousandth of the speed of light, which is beyond anything that we're capable of, it would take us 4,300 years. So the people who set off on any interstellar voyage are not even close to the same people who arrived. Unless you have the faster than light travel, and that is strictly reserved for TV. It does not exist. Okay? Questions, comments, concerns? Okay, so that was the first demo of the day. Um, that's sort of to give you the perspective, the scale of what we're going to talk about, why we're going to talk about planetary astronomy. And so, for example, some people think, well, why can't we just go take pictures of other stars? Well, that's why. We can only use telescopes, okay? And a lot of what we do is going to be centered around light, information that we get from light traveling from distant objects to us so that we can understand it. And in order to do that, we have to understand how we can obtain knowledge. Okay, so everyone has existed in the past 10 years. We've all been around to watch people argue about things that I thought were common knowledge. Okay, is the Earth flat? Oh, okay, good. Right. Not one. Sometimes you have one or two. There's nothing wrong with it. That's why you come to this class. You find out, right? Some people don't believe that anymore, right? So we're going to talk really briefly about how we construct modes of knowledge. How do we understand or attempt to understand? What is an okay scientific question? How you form those? And what makes science or the scientific method different? than just saying, well, that's a hypothesis, right? People say, oh, that's a hypothesis. What does that mean? Okay. Okay. The phone? <laughs> this is a nerd comic. If you guys like nerd comics, um, XKCD, not just on um, science, but just like lots of nerd stuff. Okay. Um, so here you start, you pull the lever, you get zapped. And a normal person says, guess I shouldn't do that. Learn once. And just says, I wonder if that happens every time. <laughs> what is that called? This, what? Is that hypothesis? Good, good. I wonder if that happens every time. It could be a theory if you want to think about it in that posture. One thing we're asking for there is reproducibility. I wonder if that happens every time I do that. I, can I build a way of understanding based on will it give me the same outcome every single time? And this is an integral part of science. Right? We can't do science unless it can be something that we can predict happens and happens every time. Right? <clears throat> Come on. Maybe curiosity? What's that? Would it be like similar to curiosity? That's a motivating factor. But we can be curious about art, right? You can be curious about fashion. You can be curious about a lot of things that we exist with in the in human nature. Um, but the way that we structure the question matters because there are inherently some questions that cannot be answered. So, for example, I'll give you an easy one. What happened before the Big Bang? Not answerable by science. Might be answerable by other means, but we don't get to call them science. It's just a different form of knowledge, right? Yeah. Well, because I think for me, if I walked up to this guy and he was like, don't pull that lever or you get zapped. And I'd be like, well, what if you just got zapped the moment you touched the handle? And then, but if he recorded the bunch of times that he's been zapped every time he pulls that lever, then I'm more likely to believe him. Right, yeah. So, for example, as opposed to pulling it, if you just touch it, do you get zapped, right? That would be a hypothesis. And that would be a hypothesis where you check your confirmation bias. So, for example, testing the negative, which is something we don't often do. Do we look on Google for the first search result that supports our theory? 
right, in the argument? Yeah. We never look for the one that proves us wrong. We scroll, oh, I didn't see that one. Scroll by that one really quickly, right? Okay. Okay, so we're going to really talk, uh, really briefly talk about um, identifying the nature of the science of nature. I know that this seems like a lot of words, but again, the scientist, not a word maker. Um, we're going to talk about scientific and non-scientific statements. We'll talk about the scientific method. Probably won't have time to get through this if I went a little long now. Um, everyone here is born between these dates, <laughs> March 21 and March 20th. You all know your signs. Okay. <laughs> all right. So please, we're going to run an experiment here. So when you, when you come up, please grab yours, just read it for yourself and sort of like note things that are applicable to you and then don't show anyone else. Does that make sense? And we're going to see how this experiment works. I wish I had clickers because I'd like to actually see the numbers, but um, what? break. What? Yeah. Because I need you all to sign something that says you're going to give it back to me. <laughs> okay. So Aquarius is not one. Okay. Aquarius is here. Capricorns. Yeah, just grab Yeah. Capricorns? Okay. Gemini? Uh, yeah, I guess if there's room. Uh, Aries? <laughs> She has I have Aries, Aries, yeah. And she has Taurus. Oh, I get the do. And he has Scorpio and Virgo. Oh, sorry, these are my LA. My bad. You guys want to introduce yourself? <laughs> uh, I'm Glory. I'm Garrett. Yeah. Okay. Um, they will be holding help sessions to help you with homework and any other concepts throughout the semester. Okay. okay, Libra. Leo, Cancer, Pisces. Oh, I guess I got everyone. <laughs> I'm okay. You're caught in candy grapes. And blueberries. Mm, no, but I can get for you. Okay, I just, I just, okay, so please take a few seconds to read yours. As I mentioned, just mark them up um, if you find stuff that uh, is applicable to you. So we're going to talk about that. We're Hold on. Don't compare. Don't look at them. Don't look at your, your... Hold on. Hold on. Everyone's trying to game the system, okay? Just read them. I told them not to share it. I What's that? Yeah, you can mark it. You can have it. That's yours. We can afford the one third piece of paper. I know it's kind of crazy. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully they don't have the best designs. I'm sorry. You guys are so sorry. It's really fun having you in the class. Okay. So since we don't have the clickers, um, the way that I like to do clickers when people don't have clickers is this. I know this is an old school method. So A would be one, B would be two. C would be three, D would be four. 
And the easiest way to do it, just so I can see that you're already, is to just put it against your chest or like in front of your face. Because if it's like this, then it sometimes gets lost in the color behind you. Okay, so when you're ready, just put up your fist to let me know. Okay, let's vote on three, two, one. Okay, some twos, a couple ones. Uh, interesting, more ones maybe on this side. There's some fours over here, more ones in the back. Okay, kind of equal, just the questions here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, how well does today's horoscope describe you? So it looks like it's kind of even. Some people said very well that they correctly identified everything I'm feeling. Some said well, some said not at all. Does that seem reasonable? Okay. Um, so let's, uh, let's ask a couple questions here. Uh, this is obviously astrology, right? So what about the horoscope made it seem accurate? Does anyone want to raise their hand and give an example? Yeah. No, like, what about it? Yeah. Made yeah. it seem accurate for you. Oh, what, what made it accurate? Um, I mean, general is, is fine. Like, did you feel that it genuinely applied to you? Yeah, I never knew that. Okay. Yeah. A lot of it felt like something that, uh, like, most humans now come around on. Okay. So generality? Well, I mean, most of it, it takes so much information, like your birthday, I looked at lots of different information, so like, it kind of, it kind of, um, some things are accurate, you say. Some, some, yeah. some of it was accurate, okay. Did you have one? Uh, it's phrased contemporary vague. Kind of okay, a little vague. Uh, if there are any accuracy, it's going to be. Okay, you can interpret it. Yeah. Hold on, hold on. Okay, any parts that seem too true to be a coincidence? Or did you kind of give an example there? I feel like, damn, they nailed me. Uh, they mind when talking about how I, I find my tend to be extroverted, and I think I'll focus on all the Uh huh, okay, good. Anyone else? Just one in the whole class. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, what? <laughs> what did you say? Did they all say the same thing? Yeah. Oh, was that obvious? <laughs> yeah, they are all identical. Okay. And they are all identical. Because they're all written intentionally, vaguely, and generally, that they could apply to you. In fact, if you look at some of the statements, they're written so they say one thing and then the exact opposite in the same line. So that if you don't like the first part, you can like the second. Or if you like the first part, you don't have to read the second one, right? Everyone feels a mixed range of emotions. Sometimes you're introverted, but sometimes you're not. Who the fuck is it, right? <laughs> okay. All right, so in fact, here's an important discussion. When we talk about astrology, right, there is an important difference between the word astrology and astronomy. Now, one of them is not better than the other. This is not a dunking contest on the idea of astrology or those who create stories and narratives, because there's a lot of important research that goes into the idea of community of like how the placebo effect can be used in medicine to help research outcomes. Like if you get sick, the idea that someone is caring for you just helps you feel better, right? So there's a reason that we're social creatures who tell stories. What is that function? It functions to like bring society together to give us meaning, to give us purpose. But does it have an outcome in your decision-making? It shouldn't, right? You should never purchase stocks because a horoscope told you. <laughs> yeah. You think that that's, I mean, you think that that's a thing, but like, you have to keep in mind, right? If you had a bad day, it's not because of where Mars was. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so one of the driving questions here is how do we distinguish between science and non-science? Okay. Um, what is meant by scientific theory? What are the things that we require from a scientific theory? And also, how does astrology differ from astronomy? And what is the scientific validity 
from the perspective of science, not from the perspective of how we might use it in our day to day lives. I think that's an important differentiation. Okay. So is luck real? Luck's real? Raise your hand if luck's real. No, no one likes raising their hand anymore. They're going to get tricked, right? <laughs> okay, what's, uh, what's your lucky number? 12, good. 27. 27, okay. Anyone else have a lucky number? 13, that's mine too. Yeah? 21. 20, oh, there you go, same. Seven, okay. So let's let's create a hypothesis. If luck is real, then we should be able to have some testable prediction, right? So let's imagine, if we will, what's a number-based game that uses luck that I could win like a lot of money, like maybe four hundred million dollars? The lottery. Oh, that's got numbers, right? And I could be a billionaire tomorrow. I'd be like, how do you, right? Okay, so if luck's real, then one of those numbers should be better than the other, right? So this would be a way of testing the hypothesis. The hypothesis is that if luck is real, then some, some numbers are more lucky than others. Okay. <clears throat> Hold on. Yeah, I already said that. And there's the data. <laughs> so these are the random white balls, just the one at the very end that you need in order to get the... Really? Um, <laughs> so here's the mega millions white ball frequency distribution since June 2005. You can download this data. I did it. I plotted it. <laughs> I wanted to see how to win. And guess what? You can't. They are really, really good at making sure that they're all evenly distributed. So even if there's a small bias towards any one of these numbers, right, they would lose potentially millions of dollars. Okay. So you look at this and you say, 48, right? Is that the way to interpret this data? No. There is some fluctuation. So the average is probably about here. And some are necessarily going to be higher and some are necessarily going to be lower. And the way that we think about this is if you take die, like the six-sided die when you go home and you roll it, you say to yourself, okay, what's the distribution that I'm going to get? Well, sometimes I'm going to get a one, sometimes I'm going to get a six, but you're not going to get all of the numbers in order. You're going to get some random assortment of them, right? But if you roll them a thousand times, then you'll get pretty close to an even number of all of them. So I should redo this probably. And if I redo this for the probably six more years of data since I first taught this class, I bet they'd be a little flat. And if you wait another 20, 30 years, they'd be even more flat, right? So this is a way of constructing a test of a hypothesis, right? Now you might say to me, or you might say to me, well, that's not a good test. I don't like that test because it wasn't my lucky number and I don't play the lottery. For example, I do things that are lucky or not lucky. So therefore I should participate in the test, right? We can do another test, right? Part of science is constructing different tests to investigate the same question from a number of different angles, right? You might take umbrage or you might dislike the test that I construct. That's perfectly okay, right? Say you write a paper that comes out that says, I didn't like the way you constructed your test. You forgot about X, Y, Z. You're done, right? And then you publish it, right? That's what people do constantly. They're fighting in science, back and forth, back and forth. One group believes this. One group believes this. They like each other, but they hate each other, right? Okay. And that's science. We don't have to all agree, but it's the process by which we do it. Um, okay, so oh God. astrology and astronomy both have roots. So they have a very similar word construct. I really like the way that language is constructed. I think it tells us a lot about how concepts are related. So I like to break down words. Astro, of course, in both of them um, means of the stars. And then this is a little confusing because onomy and ology are just the study of different ways of saying the study of. But we have to use two different phrases here. Astronomy would be um, the physics and motions of the sky. And astrology is the potential impact that they might have on your day to day. Okay. Uh, most people from this, uh, I don't know, Euro barometer 
uh, website said that horoscopes are not very scientific, but astrology somehow is. Uh, I think that is because it's very easy to confuse these two ideas. So astrology is the same as horoscopes, right? Astronomy is like, how far away is the sun, right? Okay, <laughs> different concepts. They deal with different matters. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, oh, no. oh. Go back. Now you've seen everything again. All right. Um, here we go. So, all right. We said that. <laughs> we said this. Astrology is the effort to study things outside of our planet. That's supposed to be on top. Um, they have roots in the motion of the night sky. This is the limit of their similarity. That's as far as they go. Right? They name the same sort of objects in the night sky, but they don't cover the same subject matter at all. I'm just going to press it here so it doesn't do it again. So astrology lacks consistency. And I'm going to demonstrate that in a few seconds. Um, it lacks predictive power. So, for example, a lot of the statements that are made are so general that they could or could not apply to you. And you can check this for yourself when you go home. Right. So if you could really predict the day that I was going to have, I'd be like, great, let's let's use it to make a prediction so that we can test it. If I take this line and I let it go in my hand, what's going to happen? It's going to fall. I know that that's going to happen, right? And so I test it and it happens. And every single time that I drop it, it falls. And science will tell us that every single time it'll fall, I also know how fast it'll be when it gets there, right? That's the next part, right? Talking about the predictive power. So not only is there consistency in every single time that it falls, it's also going to describe how it falls by the time that it gets to the bottom, right? And importantly, it ties together a physical mechanism. Why does it fall? So if I drop the lime, it falls because it's being attracted to the earth, right? So I can blame something for that. Whereas astrology does not attach to it a physical mechanism by which it's impacting our lives. And we'll just break apart some of these thoughts really quickly, okay? So for example, different horoscopes for dif different outcomes for the same person. So this would be the opposite of what I just showed you where I gave you all the same horoscope. Since I'm a Taurus, I looked at what today's horoscope would be. Let's look at what it says. Um, it says something about connecting my needs and wants, not an ideal time for new endeavors, but I need to branch out. Right? That's what I'm thinking. I'm open to experimenting with feelings and ideas, right? Uh, following my heart, expressing my true affections is a sense of fun. You may treat yourself with some extra time to express or enjoy yourself, create something new. But then the next one says, you tend to be curious, obviously. Um, and you're always trying to learn more about many interests. True. But today you could be eager to research a subject, be unable to find any information, no matter how many libraries or databases. Don't bother with it. You'll only get frustrated. So one of them tells me to explore. And then the next one says, don't. So now I'm not sure. So I go to the next one. And it says, what are these, this is one of those days that's not going to go well, no matter how hard you try. So now I feel like maybe I definitely should not do any exploration today, right? So how do I choose between these, right? There's a lack of consistency in the prediction, right? Because I could just pick whatever one I want. If my day goes poorly, now I can blame it on this. And if it went well, then I blame it on the first one. Like, yeah, I knew it was going to be a great day, right? Okay. So to be considered scientific, you have to make predictions. It's not scientific if it only explains what's already happened, right? So if I told you why yesterday was bad, that's a form of therapy. <laughs> if I tell you why tomorrow is going to be good, that needs to be testable, right? If I can tell you about, you know, I've done all these things and it's going to lead to this thing, that's a way of like seeing into the future, right? So, for example, astrologers make predictions. They use the sun, the moon, and the eight planets. Is that true? Nothing wrong with that scene? No trick there? Right? Well, except for they didn't always know that there was eight planets. So, for example, Uranus and Neptune were not found until telescopes. Um, so, were they just getting it wrong for like hundreds of years? 
Okay. So does the removal of Pluto change anything? Or do we need to include all of like Pluto and Ceres? Remember, I showed you there's a closer planet called Ceres. It's a little dwarf planet that sits in the asteroid belt. You'll see it. We'll see pictures of it. It's beautiful, small. Okay. Um, astrology claims that maybe electromagnetism or gravity cause the changes in our lives. Um, this is not true. Um, these forces get weaker with distance. So as you move farther away from something, the force gets smaller. So right now, the strongest that you feel attracted to the surface is at the surface. And as you move up away from the surface, you can finally get away and you can be in space, right? And then you won't be as attracted as you are at the surface. Okay? So if you think about that in the context of electromagnetism, Jupiter's magnetic field has the same strength as you on as your coaster when it's operating, which is very small. So no one ever wakes up and says, you know, I'm having a really bad day because my toaster. Well, maybe because they burnt their toast, but like, you know, mm -hmm. that's somebody, right? So we need a physical mechanism, and there isn't one to explain how this could change our lives. Okay. Okay. So this is important, not because, again, we're not dunking on the use of this, but we are separating stories that we tell ourselves from a science that is bounded. There are things that we can understand and there are things that we can't. So now I'm gonna, add, yeah. No comment, uh, partial comment, um, partial comment. I think there are certain merits and not merits to what you've said. Okay, um, <laughs> which the following can be tested by scientific means. And the important thing here is we need to think about what it means for us to do science. Can we use predictive power to understand these statements? Are they going to give consistent results, right? Because not everything that appears scientific is scientific and vice versa. So here are some different questions. Which of the following claims can be tested by scientific means? A, blue is the best color for walls. B, people born when the sun is in the constellation of Leo are more financially stable. C, God exists. D, the final thoughts of Abraham Lincoln were about the fate of his country. Hold on, put your, put your fist up if you're ready to vote. We're gonna do it all at once. Let's vote on three, two, one. Okay, a lot of non-voters. Okay, that's fine. Um, anyone want to support their argument for why they chose what they chose? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I love that what just happened here. Okay. I would say you were wrong. But what you did was you added qualifiers in order to make it a scientific question. So she took an unscientific question and turned it into one that was testable by saying, let's add some limitations. Because what is the word best? That's ambiguously defined. And what you did was, let's say blue is the best for students' mental health, right? Or babies' mental health or something, qualifying it so that it could be tested. Therefore, making it a scientific question, right? So what about the second one? Like average out the finance, like the financial. Wait, no, no. First, is it a scientific question or not? Oh, yeah. I think so. You think it is? Well, it says which of the following things can be tested by scientific means. Yeah. So I think this one can. You think it can be tested yeah. by scientific Okay. So how? Uh, we just uh, average the financial, like the income of everybody who was born during the, the mm -hmm. period that he was born in. Yeah. And compared to the other one, the people are more than Yeah. Grab a group of people, maybe like 80 students, right? Find out when they were all born, put them into groups, and figure out who is more financially stable. And if they're all equally financially stable, right? Then you just tested the hypothesis. So that's actually the scientific question. Right? Next one. <laughs> scientific question? Not a scientific question, not in the realm of science. So we describe 
how things happen. Sometimes we describe why something happens, like why the, the line falls, but not for what reason does the line fall, right? What, what made the universe? Uh, okay, we're not gonna answer that. This one here, scientific. This is an inversion of impossible to know. There are questions that we simply have to be okay with not knowing the answer. Okay? Okay, I'm already losing some of you. So before I actually lose you all, um, let's do, if you need a clicker, come up and get one and then just sign your name uh, in the um, sheet that I have here. Please do not steal this. Um, it should be organized by last name. Please bring a pen. Let's find your own. Here, you can take that. And then when you have signed it, let me know and you'll, I'll give you one of these. I want to keep cost to zero, ideally. Yeah, so we have S is here, two over a little bit. S is here. A is on this side. Here's A's. Cool. E's through J, J through M in the middle. If we need pen, but I'll put Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I guess we'll take them. <laughs> <laughs> Are we supposed to hold up cards or? Yeah, you can keep them if you don't mind. I'm going to pass these out to people who do this one. <laughs> This is A through B? A through, yeah. Oh. A through D, I believe. I don't I don't know. I don't I don't know. I do I don't know. I don't Thank <laughs> you. 